Wrestling fans, are you ready? Yes! 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 For the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Now, please welcome at this time your hosts, Graham, GSM Matthews, and RJ Marceau. You're listening to the next era of wrestling radio. This is Wrestle Rant Radio. What's going on, guys, and welcome to WrestleRant Radio for April 18th, 2024. I'm Graham G. Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well and having a great week so far. We have another awesome exclusive interview on the show today. This time, the WWE superstar and now New York Times bestselling author Becky Lynch. So a lot like the Paul Heyman interview that I put up on the show last week, I did this prior to WrestleMania. It went up on Bleach Report and on my YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash WrestleRant. I think the day before Mania, on the Friday before Mania, but we're putting it up now here on the show, just I didn't have a chance to air it here on WrestleRant Radio until now. So we talk all about her new book, we talk about Mania itself, which is obviously outdated at this point, but a lot about her book and her feuds with Bianca Belair, Shayna Baszler, what she's been doing with Rhea Ripley as of late, and a lot more. So it's a great chat, hope you guys check it out on the YouTube channel in video form and the article version over on Bleach Report from a few weeks ago, as I mentioned. And you can enjoy the audio version here today on WrestleRant Radio. Before we throw it to my conversation with Mr. Marceau, talking the latest in the world of WWE and AEW. New episodes available every single week on WrestleRant.com, WrestleRantRadio.com, iTunes, Spotify. No longer on Google Podcasts. I'll mention that later as well. I think the Google Podcast page got shut down. They're no longer pushing podcasts to Google Podcasts, but we're on YouTube Music now. Basically, it's the new episodes I air of the show on the channel, I put them up in their entirety on YouTube, on the channel, on the WrestleRant channel, uh, about a day or two after they go up on the regular feed. So if you want them up to date, don't go to YouTube, but they're usually up on YouTube by Friday, Saturday, Sunday, typically Friday. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, but we're on Podbean, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and Amazon Music. Find the show, rate the show, review the show, subscribe to the show. Never miss a new episode every single week. So with that being said, enjoy my exclusive candid conversation with WWE superstar and New York Times bestselling author, Becky Lynch. Grim Matthews here with Bleach Report ahead of the upcoming release of Becky Lynch's new book, The Man Not Your Average Average Girl. we got two uh, two averages in there. It's available this coming Tuesday, March 26th. Pre-order right now on Amazon. Audiobook also going to be available uh, starting next week. Becky, thanks for taking the time ahead of WrestleMania. I know your schedule is really busy right now. Oh, my pleasure. I know you're going to be coming to Madison, Connecticut, actually, in about a week. That's one of your stops. So I am I live, like, literally 20 minutes out from there. So I'm looking forward to being at the book signing next week. Because you're going to Boston, New York City. I saw CT on there. I'm like, first of all, that's random. That, you know, <laughs> that sort of stuff never really happens in Connecticut. But it's literally within, like, 20 minutes. So I think you're going to enjoy the area when you're here next weekend. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, no, I I, I, uh, I, I don't make the schedule. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'm, like, happy to... Happy to go out. I mean, I'll go anywhere, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I love I love going to different towns. And Connecticut's always so quaint, you know? It is. So it's, quaint. It's Just quaint. It's quiet. Coffee shops and yeah. everything is, yeah, beautiful. So that's what it is, actually. The place where you're doing the signing is a, co- it's a coffee shop. They have, like, food in there and stuff. So it's going to be right up your alley, I think. Great. Come see me. Let's eat some sandwiches. <laughs> Drink some forward. coffee. I love it. This is everything, everything that I love. It's perfect timing coming right into WrestleMania. Obviously, the book is out right beforehand, so perfect timing on the release. But listen, you're the number one contender for the Women's World Championship right now. You're an author, but you're also now an American citizen. Congrats on that. How did that happen? Thank thank you very much. Uh, Well, I went for a test, and then I passed the test, and then that's it. Um, But, you you know, you have to have a green card for a certain amount of time before Mm. you can go for your citizenship. So uh, I, I reached a certain amount of time, and I was like, let's go. Did that just coincide with your recent appearance at the White House on uh, St. Patrick's Day or no? 
pure coincidence pure wow. coincidence yeah uh so because i did i did I, I went to the white house on 17th and then the very next day i had my citizenship test i had to actually leave early so that i could go catch a flight to go do my citizenship test that's yeah. crazy was the test yeah. as hard as you expected it to be it's so absurdly easy really <laughs> well look i mean i'm a history buff right but um but there's also like an app you can get and it, it tells you like a hundred questions that they may ask. And uh, you just learn those questions. There you go. You go and, and answer them. Like the, 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 I, I felt bad. There was a, a poor lad beside me and, uh, and he just didn't speak English. And I think that was the thing that tripped him up more than anything. Cause the, the poor guy kept asking him if he swore to tell the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And the guy kept saying, no, I was like, oh, I just didn't, didn't understand. <laughs> God bless him. So anyway, I didn't have that problem, thankfully. That's good. That's good. Yeah. But listen, it's it's been a very busy time for you, obviously, with Mania coming up, doing the uh, citizenship uh, test, as you mentioned, on Monday. But writing the book as well. So I saw a clip on Twitter recently where you said, I think it was during an up, up, down, down stream, I think. You mentioned that during your recent run in NXT, you rewrote the whole book. Like you rewrote the book. Like how did, like how? How did you do that? I don't know. Uh <laughs> um by typing very fast i uh i just didn't like how it was how it was playing out i just i felt like like i was like where is where is the through line what's the story what fits what doesn't fit and how do i like craft this so that you want to keep turning the page and and so i like i had done a writing course and I don't know about you, but like I'm one of those people that can learn something and then it just doesn't click until a little while later. You're like, oh, oh, mm -hmm. yeah. And I, and I think that was kind of what happened with me, where it just kind of clicked. And I, I was like, oh, now now I understand how to write a book in a way that is engaging and, and will have people turning the page because I liked what I'd written and I thought like, it was well written but maybe the things didn't fit in and you have to then figure out what stories what stories stay and what go and, yeah. and so I actually ended up like chopping out a, a bunch of stories but elongating and and um setting the scene and the tone more for the ones that I had in there so does that mean like this stuff is on the table for a potential sequel of all the stuff you didn't put in the original book or 100%, no? 100%. <laughs> oh, okay, great. But that was the hard thing. That was, the, that. I mean, that's the hard thing about wrestling is that it keeps going, you know, yeah. like, so I haven't retired. So, so I was like writing while life was continuing and, and I had to figure out an end point for this book. I was like, okay, no, it needs to end at some stage because I can't just keep writing until the deadline about mm -hmm. like the things that are happening. So, um, so I picked the, uh, a, an end and I kind of ended it where I came back at SummerSlam in, uh, in 2021. Um, but then I kind of surmised that the following year, which ended up being my favorite year in wrestling and a lot of dramatic stuff happened in that year too. So uh, there, there, there could be a sequel. Uh, that's a pretty good place to end, too. I mean, coming back from your pregnancy, winning the championship at SummerSlam, like you said, the heel turn that followed in the year, uh, you know, the, the subsequent year from there, the stuff with Bianca, which was just incredible. And that's been kind of the thing that people latched onto in the past week and kind of getting hyped about the book and people reading certain stories and stuff you've never shared before, including that little story about Bianca, about how you went up to her following the match. She was crying and you told her, listen. I'll do right by you beyond this, which is crazy to hear in retrospect. I mean, I have no doubt that was the case even at the time, but I mean, you did at WrestleMania, you ended up putting her over in a pretty big way. So just kind of talk about that. I mean, as far as some of the stories that people read in this book, stuff that people have not heard before now, uh, including that, like the Shayna thing too, kind of similar story again, right before you got pregnant, you wanted to lose to a WrestleMania and obviously ended up retaining the championship, but little stuff like that will make this a, a, a can't miss book for wrestling fans and just people in general. Yeah. So like I've, I've not really looked at like wrestling in terms of uh, wins and losses mm -hmm. um, and more in terms of, of, of stories. And I think that's always kind of been, been um, beneficial to, to me, but it's also like, like with Shayna specifically, we had gone through great lengths to make sure she wasn't, she, she looked like a star, you know, like, 
that she went through everybody in that elimination chamber um, quite harshly. And it was like, well, if we're going to do that, well, then we might as well pull the trigger, you know, and and uh, and, and we didn't. And I um, I I I thought that was a bit of a miscalculation, but um, people disagreed with me. And, and I suppose it's up to you to decide. But, you know, sometimes I think like if we're going to if we're going to go there with the story, let's just go there with the story. And with Bianca that was the thing of, 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 I was the, I was the heel. I was going to take it from, and I know a lot of people were like, uh, uh, you know, they like, they could have at least had a match and we could have, mm. but, but I, I thought it, I, I do actually think it was better that I kind of caught her off guard as opposed to having a five, 10 minute match and then beating her. And, and it just wouldn't have had the same effect at WrestleMania because you know, and even the way that we started the match at WrestleMania, I you know, with with the same thing and her kicking out, I, like, um, and Bianca is just such a pro. But like, I remember, I remember thinking like, this girl has no reason to trust me. Like, she doesn't, she doesn't know me. But uh, she was so gracious, and she is the embodiment of a superstar. So I'm glad that I'm glad uh, we had that match. And and you know, sometimes it was. <laughs> There were some curveballs thrown at us. Uh, I was told that we would never touch until Mania. <laughs> um, That's tough, yeah. Yeah, and and then and then the match almost didn't happen, and we we had to fight for that as well. But but thankfully, thankfully it did all happen, and uh, and we got to do by, right by that story. I can't imagine. And it's one what of my else... favorite stories. I know it's just a fantastic story. I mean, you talk all about that in the book, not just that story, but like your entire career. I feel like ironically and, and not just the fact that you're married to Seth but Seth also having a very logical character development and you as well especially in the last couple of years again the organic rise specifically from like 2018 onwards and obviously all of this is covered in the book but doing that the heel stuff when you came back and everything else since then even your rise to the women's championship of what we're seeing right now I just can't imagine what else that would have been with Bianca at that mania two years ago if it wasn't that, I don't know. I just feel like, especially lately, we've had a more organic stream of storytelling, the Rhea match making sense, the Bianca stuff making sense. I don't know. I, I feel like, especially with you specifically, you've been in your element, not only in the ring, but storytelling wise. It's been spe spectacular to see over the past year or so. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. No, I, I, I do feel like, uh, I'm, I'm maybe this is conceitedness, but uh, how I'll be conceited. I'll be arrogant. Uh, I think I'm doing my best work. Uh, I think I have been ever since I came back and uh, from having having my child. And I know a lot of people didn't like my uh, heel run, but uh, screw them. I had a great time. <laughs> I had a great time and I felt like I got to tell some great stories. I, I, I felt like um, anybody that I worked with, hopefully for the most part, came out better um, than before. And so... Um, and so, yeah, so I'm really, I'm really proud of the work that I've been doing. Like, and that's all it's about, really, you know, like I think uh, Rick Rubin always says um, that the audience comes last. You've got to tell the, tell the stories and make mm -hmm. the, the art that, that you like. But in wrestling, it's different because the audience comes first, right? Like everything that we do, we're trying to elicit a response from the audience. And sometimes the stuff that you like and you think is good maybe the audience doesn't doesn't feel that um but i think we're at the point where it's a little bit symbiotic again you know i think so i mean it's pretty organic the stuff that we're seeing I mean, just from a fan standpoint i mean i think just watching weekly it's pretty clear that what we're seeing now is a lot more organic and what people want to see obviously changing directions we saw that recently with cody we saw that with you five years ago and uh, the rise of the man to wrestlemania and stuff like that i mean just talk about obviously talk a lot in the book about the rise to that WrestleMania five years ago, being there myself, an amazing moment when you won the championship and just where you are now, you once again, find yourself in that contender spot, but obviously you're a mother now, a lot has changed in your career, a lot more accomplished even than you were five years ago. And you were one of the top talents even then as well. Just talk about where you are, not just mentally, but like just where you are in the headspace, the mindset going into mania this year, now an author as well compared to five years ago. Well, the mindset is, is, is that I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm better than I've ever been. I feel like I am uh, really re uh, at my at my peak and in my prime, and uh, and it's funny because 
uh, I've always thrived by being underestimated. Like that's what I've always done my best work is is when I have that little bit of a chip on my shoulder when people doubt me and like Rhea has been you know, on a hell of a hot run for the last little while but uh, but I've been the one doing all the hard work in the background and 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 uh, raising everybody's game and I, I said it in a promo and I it, it's true to life is that when people believe in me I'm good but when people doubt me I'm great because I. That there's something about that chip and and as much as I doubt myself like I can doubt myself but you can't doubt me <laughs> you know it just it like it it raises something in me, uh, a fury and a fire and uh pushes me like like nothing else and I, I feel I, I feel that going into this match no I think it's definitely which is heaven. where I'm most comfortable yeah, no, definitely. I think that line that you just said now and that you said in the promo a couple of weeks ago where you said, you know, you doubt me, I'm great. I'm good, but I'm great once you doubt me was just such a great line. Like, I don't know, and I feel like it comes across the average viewer, and that's what I love about having the book right here in front of me as well, the, the early copy, not even oh, the- Oh, uh, you, got, you got the real early copy. Yeah, the real early copy, exactly. I'll be bringing this to the signing next week. Um, But you, you just talk about in, you know, as far as what we're seeing on TV right now and, and, and being doubted over the course of your career, it's just that's what made you such a perennial fan favorite over the course of your career and what we're seeing now, right now. Like I said, just feeling that much more organic compared to, you know, five years ago when stuff might have been force fed and at different points in your career and stuff like that. But going back to the book, as far as like sharing stories and stuff like that, I've never written an autobiography myself. So I'm, I'm just curious about the process when it comes to sharing stories. Like, what is it like having to get like the permission of the people involved or like, what do you, where do you draw the line with what you want to share, what you don't want to share? Obviously certain pictures went viral with what you put in the book, you know, well, people can see that. I won't elaborate more. You can see it in the book when you get a copy, but just talk about that a little bit as far as what goes into it and, and what you feel like you should and shouldn't share. Uh, well, I never asked anybody permission because yeah, uh, maybe I should have. <laughs> But I also just go, eh, if you ask permission, uh, no, why would I you shouldn't have to ask permission, I don't think, because it's my story, yep. right? Like it's it's my story, it's my perspective. And I put a disclaimer in the beginning that that all of this is from memory. It is my perspective, my perspective. I try to be self-aware, so I try to know when I'm the asshole, but understand that it is also my perspective and i am biased towards myself and sure. um, so 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 hopefully you'll get to decide if 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 i'm self-aware enough or not uh, and so i think once you start asking permission then you're kind of clouded by by the moral police in, mm -hmm. in some regard like some somebody's somebody's voice is over your shoulder and then you can't get to really write your story in the way that you want to because then you're taking everybody else into account and I did a writing course with Neil Strauss and he said to me you know uh that it's it's never the big things that you think is going to offend people it's something small it's it's always going to be something that you never accounted for that people are going to go well what I'm I don't sound like that or wh whatever it is and uh and 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 so so we'll see what people get offended by. I'm sure they'll I'm sure there'll be a little bit, but I, I I try to be fair to people. Like I try to be very aware that this is my book and people don't get to defend themselves in my book. So how can I defend them too while giving my side of the story and my perspective? And so um and so I think what was your question was how did I decide what goes in and what stays out? Yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it, this this story I think is is more is more than just a story about wrestling. It's mm -hmm. a story about dreaming. It is a story about overcoming the odds. It is uh, it is a story about bringing a dream to fruition. Things that you didn't think were possible things that other people didn't think were possible. It's overcoming the doubts in your head and overcoming um, the obstacles and, and the stuff that people say to you and how do you take that and use it as fuel and not let it ruin you. So um, so it's more of a story of, of like almost a, a, a coming of age story, you know, like you're, you're seeing this girl grow up 
uh, trying to navigate the society pressures of, of being a woman, what's expected in wrestling, and, uh, and then arriving at a place that she only dreamed about, having absolutely no right to be there, being average as all hell, not having a clue how to figure it out, and then figuring it out, <laughs> you know? And so, um, and, and so that was the story. And so then any stories that didn't support that story, then just have to, they may have been interesting, they may have been good, but they, if, they, if they weren't in line with the story of the book, I have to get them out, you know? Fantastic. Well, I mean, like you said, anything that wasn't included in this one that you may not have felt that it was fitting for this one, potential sequel. I mean, maybe maybe the movie at some point. I mean, I think people would exactly. be coming for that. Exactly. It's got to be coming at some point. But obviously the book is available next week, March 26th from when we speak right now on Tuesday pre-order on Amazon right now. The audiobook also available uh, soon after as well. The Man, Not Your Average Average Girl. Becky, thanks for taking the time. I really appreciate it. If I had to recommend a place in the area, if you're around in Connecticut long enough to check out, it's called Brother Mike's in Madison. Great sandwich shop. Granda Pizza as well is also fantastic. So if you got time and you're a pizza person, then definitely check it out. I am a pizza person. Hell yeah. <laughs> I appreciate the time, Becky. Thanks so much who's for taking the time. It's been awesome. Yeah, but a question: Who's not a pizza person? Are there people that are like, I'm not a big, I'm not into pizza. That's good. That's yes, correct. But I know with Mania but, right around the corner, everyone might be uh, like really cracking down as far as like I don't know. I mean, maybe you just don't give a shit. I mean, I don't, I don't blame you, but I'm 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 bulking. I'm there you go. Bulk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I'm 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 trying to bulk for the life for the life of me since I've had this child. I cannot put weight on and it's just such a like an arbitrary complaint but uh <laughs> I'm just running after her the whole time and uh yeah so I've been I've been really trying to trying to book you know I feel like hey I, I, I take I take I take too many bumps to be this skinny you know? <laughs> I feel like you could do a whole other book on motherhood alone and the lessons you've learned you know since becoming a mom I'm sure as far as like stuff like that like little you know tidbits I mean I think a lot of people would find that fascinating yeah maybe that'll be the sequel mm, well we look forward to it well thanks again for the time becky i appreciate it. i'll catch you down the road i'm sure i'll catch you next saturday the book signing in madison hell yeah big thanks to becky for the time as i mentioned earlier you could also check out the video version of that interview over my youtube channel right now youtube.com backslash wrestle rant and the article version over on bleach report from right before wrestlemania now we throw it to my conversation with Mr. Marceau talking Raw, SmackDown from the past week, and predictions for Sunday's AEW Dynasty pay-per-view. Mr. Marceau, brother, how you doing? Doing good, how are you? I am doing well, my friend. We have a lot to get into here today. Like I said, SmackDown last week was a newsworthy episode last week, coming off of WrestleMania. Didn't have a chance to talk about it, as we obviously talked earlier in the day on Friday. Uh, but I wasn't sure how much storyline development we would get coming out of the Bloodline stuff at WrestleMania with Roman Reigns losing the championship and whatnot. We got a pretty significant development of Solo Sokoa in the ring, kind of, sort of, not really, but kind of declaring himself the new tribal chief of the Bloodline, exiling Jimmy Uso, Paul Heyman not in favor of that, which was interesting. And then also the debut of Tama Tonga as a member of the Bloodline as well, aiding Solo Sokoa and attacking Jimmy Uso. Like I said, a pretty significant development here, not only... Jimmy Uso being booted from the group, which was long overdue. He really has not done a lot for the group in a while. That being said, Solo Sokoa has not won a match in six months, so he probably should be looking in the mirror when he said, oh, wins and losses have consequences, which got a good hearty laugh out of me. But we also had the debut of Tama Tonga on SmackDown as well, so a lot of angles to discuss here, but what were your immediate thoughts after what we saw on Friday night? I liked it. I mean, like you said, I think it was funny when he said wins and losses matter and he hasn't won a match in months, but we'll just gloss <laughs> over that, I guess. But uh, like you said, getting Jimmy out of the group was definitely necessary. He's been like a goof side piece of the bloodline since he rejoined last August. So glad to get him out with Tama Tonga. Like you said, I think it's a great addition, more more serious. And uh, I'm interested to see where we go now because like, is he said the tribal chief said to get Jimmy out. Was that The Rock? Or is that Roman? Like, we don't know. So there's definitely some uh, some unknowns there and Solo kind of being the face right now. And uh, it's interesting. Obviously, only the beginning, I would assume, the inevitable debut has got to be next of uh, Jacob Fatu, right? Can't wait. It's got to be either a backlash or maybe soon after. Listen, they have an entire year to tell this story. Now, I think we discussed this last week. The report was already out at that point that Rock wants 
Cody Rhodes at WrestleMania 41. I think The Rock came out with an Instagram video after we spoke on Friday. It might have been Thursday, I don't remember. But um, it looks like all signs are pointing to that match being at Mania next year, which to I say, no thanks. Uh, I want the match. Obviously, everyone wants the match. We've been saying that for a while. But I think to wait an entire year, regardless of what Cody, whether Cody's champion or not, and that probably would be the championship match, I would have to imagine, um, just seems too long, only to you know hold off on Rock and Roman until WrestleMania 42. I mean, two years can go by like that, but still, I just feel like that might be too far away. But they do have a lot of stuff to carry us between now and then, like you said. Where does The Rock stand on this? Is he the new tribal chief? Is it Solo Sokoa? Tama Tonga's role in this whole thing is very exciting as well. Is This got, is, This has got to be leading to a bloodline babyface reunion, right? With the Usos reuniting at some point, Roman Reigns alongside them, although that probably won't be for the foreseeable future. Yeah, well, I think that's where we're going to get down the line. Like I said, I think, realistically, I'd rather do Cody and Rock before WrestleMania 41. I know Rock can mention that, like you said, but I mean, I, I, I also, I guess we don't really know Rock's movie schedule, so it could kind of pull that up. But, I mean, I'd rather do that SummerSlam, and then we get Rock and Roman at WrestleMania. Like I said, I guess they could stretch it out, but, I mean, I know we're in, like, the fourth inning, but, like... <laughs> all that stuff eventually is going to get tiresome. So uh, I like how they did change some things up, but uh, we need the payoff sooner than uh, than later. And who's to say it's a one and done either? They could do Rock and Roman at WrestleMania next year and have Rock win maybe, and then they could stretch it out for another six months to a year. And at that point, that sounds excessive, but it's better than just doing Rock and Roman in two years from now, which I know they had done with John Cena and Rock. They separated that or stretched that out for an entire year. But what a lot of people don't forget, though, is that the time that they spent for Rock and Cena to build up that first match was very good, in my opinion, as a fan over 10 years ago when it happened. But there was also a lot of filler stuff you had to keep Cena busy with as well. They got really lucky with the Summer of Punk stuff, but beyond that, he had to feud with fucking Kane, he had some random-ass matches and feuds with Alberto Del Rio, and all these other sort of people did John Cena. Uh, They really had to work to stretch that whole thing out. Awesome Truth as well. Um, I, I really don't want to see that with these guys. I know there's enough active members of the group to keep it going on TV, but Roman Reigns isn't on TV every single week. And on that note, WrestleVotes came out and said yesterday, coming off the photo that was circulating of Roman on a new movie set, I think Kiki Palmer put it up on her IG story or something like that. Um, he's busy doing a movie right now. He wasted no time getting back to work, but not in the wrestling ring. It's a new movie or whatever it is. Um, I guess uh, Keanu Reeves is in it as well, which sounds pretty cool. They had mentioned in the report that he will not be back anytime soon. He's going to be gone for an indefinite period of time, an indefinite period of time. But while he's gone, he still has full creative control over what we see on TV with the Bloodline storyline and everything else, which I think has been the case pretty much since the beginning. So I think I asked you last week, but I'll ask you again coming off that report. I think it's safe to say we will probably not see Roman until at least SummerSlam, if not soon after. If not, probably until Survivor Series, maybe even the Royal Rumble. Jeez, I feel like that would be too long. SummerSlam, I think I'd be fine with Royal Rumble. Jesus Christ. I, well, you never know. Yeah. yeah. Like you said, you never know. I feel like that would be a little too long, but like I said, I did see that he's filming a movie, so hey, get guys right back out uh, on the grind, just not in the WWE. But uh, no, I think SummerSlam sounds about right, and I'm, I'm real hopeful not for Royal, Royal Rumble. I feel like Royal Rumble would be a little too far for, for my liking. Yeah, they also need enough time to kind of build up you know, a lot of the storyline stuff in, in the leading up to that. And people are holding out hope, and I'm not exactly optimistic as we, it sounds sexy on paper, but I'm not sure if it's actually going to happen. The whole Bloodline Civil War War Games match uh, with Roman and the Usos, and people were speculating, oh, Sami Zayn, or like I said, Seth Rollins, or whatever. I, I don't know if that exactly makes sense. I think the, I mean, they would just stick out like a sore thumb. I know they were. You know, Rollins was previously friends with Roman and the Shield, and Sammy was previously a member of the Bloodline. But otherwise, it's all members of the NOI family, with them and Tamatanga, Jacob Fatu, Solo Rock. To have, like, Rollins or Sammy in there would be a bit forced, I think. Um, Hikaleo also rumored potentially to be WWE bound. He's still in New Japan right now, but I think his contract comes due in June, which is only two months away. So he's another member of the group. Who we've seen, he's been in TNA, but he's also made a handful of appearances in AEW as well over the years. Um, he could also soon be WWE bound, joining the storyline, and 
joining the bloodline or whatever the case might be. So I'm curious to see where they go with it. I thought the development was great. It was probably the biggest thing to happen on SmackDown last week on what was an overall good show. But also on the show, we found out our next two potential number one contenders to the WWE Championship, and that's what they're calling it, the undisputed WWE title. Um, they're still separating the Universal Championship. They haven't really exactly cleared that up as whether that's as far as whether that's going to be retired or not. I would think so, but that's a whole mess in and of itself. So AJ Styles and LA Knight will fight tomorrow night on Friday Night SmackDown, as we speak right now, to determine the number one contender to Cody Rhodes at Backlash. Again, I think it's pretty much a slam dunk as we speak here right now that it's going to be AJ Styles and Cody Rhodes at Backlash. So with that being said, your thoughts on that match matchup, and is AJ the perfect fit for the first challenger for Cody Rhodes heading into his first pay-per-view as champion? Yeah, I do like that. It's, it's LA Knight and, and Styles in the finals of this little uh, number one contendership like match. Thing that they're doing, mm -hmm. I, think so. I think it's clear as day it's going to be AJ. So I guess AJ gets his win back from WrestleMania. Don't hate that, and I think it's a good first uh, feud for Cody or first match or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, he's not going to win, obviously, but I think it'll be a good match, and the feud could be good. They can kind of tap into the Bullet Club background, which they haven't been afraid to do in the past, even during the Vince McMahon era. But now that we're in the Triple H, Paul Levesque era, whatever you want to call it, um, I feel like there's a good chance they could. Definitely deep dive into that. And they were not in the group at the same time, but they did both use the group as a launching pad to bigger and better things in WWE ultimately. So they can kind of talk about how they cross similar paths, but never really cross paths one on one until now. So I'm looking forward to that. They also announced Damian Priest and Jey Uso will indeed happen at Backlash for the World Heavyweight Championships. That's coming up on May 4th. Um, not this weekend. But not next weekend either. That's in two and a half weeks is that pay-per-view. So it's already coming up quick, even though WrestleMania felt like it wasn't all that long ago. That's going to be on Saturday, May 4th, I think in the afternoon. But as we transition to Raw on Monday night, I thought that was an even bigger show than what we got on SmackDown last week or what we even got on Raw a week ago with a lot of different moving parts. And it gave me PTSD watching that show, as you probably know as well and felt the same way. With it being in Montreal, the same arena that we saw Elimination Chamber in and SmackDown in uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, a great show on Monday, lively crowd, great arena, old as shit. But listen, it's got a great atmosphere from when we were there last year. A lot of memories in that building. Um, but one of the big things coming out of that show was that we have a, or, or, or soon going to have anyway, a new women's world champion. Rhea Ripley having to vacate the championship at the beginning of the show. We found out hours before the show went live that she was injured in that backstage segment with Liv Morgan a week ago on Raw. Um, wasn't off the chair shot. It was after she got thrown into the wall. So freak thing, Liv's not, I mean, she is responsible, quote unquote, but she's, there's no heat on her for it. I mean, shit happens, obviously. I think she separated her shoulder or tore her AC joint or something like that. So Rhea's going to be gone for a little bit. I assume it's long enough to where they felt it was necessary to vacate the championship because, like, Rollins was gone. He didn't wrestle for a good two, two and a half months, and he was still World Heavyweight Champion going into WrestleMania. You didn't want to interrupt your WrestleMania plans. This is a bit different. But if Rhea can get away with not defending it for two months, which she has done in the past... They could have gone forward with that. I'm not sure what the extent of the injury is and how long they expect her to be out. Um, but she did have to vacate the championship of 380 days on Monday night. And we are going to have a new Women's World Champion. So again, a lot of stuff to kind of cover here as far as this goes. Your thoughts on the actual you know, injury itself, I suppose, and how this kind of, before we get into who's going to win the championship, how this sets up a bigger feud, I would say, between Rhea and Liv for when Rhea comes back down the road. No, yeah, I think it's, it's kind of, not that funny, but like, Liv got hurt by Rhea, and Rhea got hurt by Liv, and it kind of fuels right into the feud that they already had. So in that aspect, I guess, I don't know if it's a blessing in disguise, but I feel like it kind of worked out perfectly in that aspect. They can heat up that feud even more. Um, so that, I think that, like, obviously you don't want to see anyone get hurt, but I don't know, the scenario kind of storyline-wise kind of, like, fuels it even makes the feud even bigger than it was going to be. So I, I, in that aspect, I guess that's a positive. Definitely don't want to see Rhea injured and out, but... Um, I know she did have some issues with her wrist, too, so maybe she can, while she's out with the shoulder, she mm -hmm. can get that back to 100% as well. But, uh, no, I mean, I saw the report early on Monday. I was like, uh-oh. And then she had to re relinquish the belt. I mean, people saying, like, why does she have to relinquish and not Rollins? I mean, I think if Rollins got hurt at the same time that she did, they'd probably make him drop the belt. But since it was going into WrestleMania, they already had their plans. So I'm not going to feel like they're not going to have him drop the belt. So I think that's just a different situation out of male or female difference i think it was just the timing of it happening like they knew he'd be back for wrestlemania no reason to take him off the belt off him going into mania if he didn't have to so 
I think that's the main difference. I know people have been complaining, like, oh, because she's a woman, they're making her take the money. I think it's just the circumstance of time. And like you said, we all also know how long she's going to be out. But I think dropping the belt, we'll see what happens next week. But I think, like you said, I think with her being in the feud with Liv already, I think it kind of fuels her eventual return to face Liv again. Now, Rhea was already getting cheered prior to Monday night. She's been getting cheered for a long time now in this heel character because she plays the role so well. Uh, Liv wasn't getting booed necessarily, but she could be getting booed going forward if she takes credit, and she already has, for injuring Rhea Ripley. So, do you think when she comes back, when Rhea comes back, I don't know about the Judgment Day and where that's going to be come three, four, five, six months from now. Do you think there's a chance that we could see this feud rekindled when they come back, obviously, like we just said, but with the roles reversed? with Rhea Ripley as the baby face and Liv Morgan as the heel. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, Liv's leaning right into it. WWE's leaning into it, saying that she's the reason why Rhea got hurt. And uh, I think, like you said, Rhea at this point was already getting cheered. I think once she comes back, I would I would have the roles reversed and have Liv be the heel and Rhea be the baby face. I mean, with Judgment Day, she could still be aligned with them if she's a full-fledged baby face or maybe just playing that role. <laughs> the group may not even... I, I, I would... I don't think the group will not exist by then. I, I feel like the group got a new shot in the arm, like a new lease on life, so to speak, with the World Heavyweight Championship win for Damian Priest at WrestleMania. But we'll talk about the draft next week, because the draft is coming up actually next Friday as we speak right now. So a lot to we'll do our, another mock draft as we did last year and all the other years um, next week here. But I don't know where Judgment Day goes. I don't know if they go to SmackDown with the World Heavyweight Championship. I know Cody Rhodes had kind of said that, I'm a SmackDown guy now, but that could only be until the draft, which is next week. So, I don't know. It's difficult to say. Um, I feel like Judgment Day could use a new change of scenery on SmackDown on Friday nights. Maybe, uh, you know, Rhea Ripley goes with them or she's separated, which in storyline you would draft the entire Judgment Day and not just certain members. It's not like the draft of, you know, 15 years ago when you have to be drafted. You have to be drafted individually. Uh, so I don't know how exactly that's going to work. But that is an interesting dynamic, though, for when they come back to have Rhea Ripley as the uh, babyface and Liv Morgan as the heel. But as we get into the conversation, and you already know my answer, as far as who should win the Women's World Championship in Rhea's absence, they're crowning a new champion next week. They're not wasting any time. They want to do it before the draft. I would assume because they want to draft the champion um, and not have to deal with it after the fact. They're not even waiting until backlash, which, like I said, is in two and a half weeks. So I think that's interesting, but there's really not a lot of options. Unless they have people from SmackDown and whatever they're doing next Monday, or they have people from NXT and whatever they're doing next Monday. They haven't announced whether it's a mini tournament that will conclude in one night, or a battle royal, or whatever it might be. Maybe a fatal four-way or something, we just don't know. Uh, there really aren't a lot of options. Now, literally there are, because there's a lot of women on Raw. There's not a lot of credible options, though. There's only... Two names I can think of, that being Liv Morgan and Nia Jax. Now, you again, you already know what I'm going to say, so I'll save that for after what you're going to say. But um, just how this, just discuss before we get into who you think is going to win the championship. How do you think this really exposes kind of a bigger issue in the Raw Women's Division right now? Something we've talked about in the past, but this really is something they need to fix in the draft and get more star power on Raw, or at least get women that are over. There's a lot of women on Raw I'm a fan of, but a lot of them are just not over right now. Yeah, I mean, like you said, I, 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 if she was, I think she's taking time off, but obviously you put Becky in that conversation as well. Um, and like mm-hmm. you said, I think Liv or Nia would be the only other two people on Raw right now that are kind of on the roster that you would have to probably say have the best chance of winning unless they do something like include SmackDown people or NXT. But like you said, I think it also just exposes what you said in the past, like. Even before Liv came back on Raw, realistically, it was Rhea, Becky, and then once Nia came back, she did. She was over, had some kind of reaction, but they have like Natalia, Tegan Knox, Zoe, Shayna, the uh, Indy, Candice, the, the other two girls, Carter and Chance. Like they're on the show a lot, but they just no one cares about them. Mm-hmm. So I think SmackDown does have more over women. So I think we'll see. Hopefully, in the draft, they'll they'll send a couple of those women over to Raw, which would be nicely needed but if we're going based on raw people alone i think i think they should put the belt on live i know i know how you feel but i just think it's kind of just right in front of them might as well do it now lean into it have live hold the bell and then once she's Rhea's back she goes right into a feud with live well listen i would love to see live win my rationale for having <laughs> nia Jax win that was my answer to have nia Jax win the women's world championship 
is that you can build to a Liv Morgan win. Now, I don't know if they turn Liv Morgan heel right away. If the reactions are strong enough, and I guess we'll find out in the coming weeks on Raw, then you turn her heel soon and this wouldn't really work. But I'm just saying that with Nia Jax, if they were already planning on having a heel women's world champion, you just replace her with Nia Jax, who's also a dominant heel in that women's division. Now, again, if they're going to turn Liv Morgan heel, they can do that. I just would not... And I know you're a big Becky fan as well. I would not put the belt on Becky. I just feel like, yeah, she lost a Mania, and it wouldn't be the worst thing to have her hold the championship. She's credible. She hasn't held a main roster singles championship in about two years. I get that. But unless you give the belt to Becky, whoever wins it has to lose it to Liv. The end game here has to be Liv Morgan. But you're just saying rush right into it and give her the championship on Monday. That, that's what you're arguing, though. I, I would just say give her a little bit more of a chase and have her be either Becky or Nia for that belt maybe in a month or two, and then Liv holds it from that point through SummerSlam or whenever Rhea Ripley comes back. But you just said you don't want Becky winning that. I mean, I'm not I'm not super high on that idea, but if I she does... Like if, I feel like, I guess if you, if Becky had won it, then it makes sense, and Liv can be, like, obviously Liv had, like, the little feud with Becky before Mania, wins it from her, and then you face Rhea. I just, like, she, if she's basically turning heel her, then beating Nia wouldn't really make a lot of sense. Mm. So I feel like it would either have to be her straight up, or Becky or Becky wins it. Or like I said, or maybe some kind of crazy scenario that we're not thinking of, but based on raw people, I think Liv makes the most sense, and then if you were going to put on Becky, then Liv could then, like, I guess, beat Becky, get some more credibility, and then face Rhea when she gets back. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's really... If it's any of those women, I would not be upset, is my point. I guess even if Nia Jax won it, I wouldn't be mad at it as much as I would have been a year ago, six months ago. Because uh, she's improved a lot. We've said that here on the show. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm the biggest Nia Jax fan. Never have been, never will be. But she's put in the work. She's gotten... I mean, she was already over because people just never really liked Nia, so she's always gotten good heat. Um, I would not be upset if they went in that direction, is my point. And I think Liv Morgan is the right call, though, just in the sense that... Ultimately, regardless of what happens, she has to win that championship and get an actual run this time. And if they were to do Liv and Becky with the roles reversed, that's another intriguing thing, too, to keep in mind. Where Liv Morgan, if she goes heel soon, Becky comes back. As long as Becky doesn't beat her for the belt, that's all that really matters. But you can do that feud again. They feuded a few years ago, but Becky was the heel. And Liv was never able to beat Becky Lynch. But this time, Liv Morgan's the heel. And this time, she can finally beat Becky Lynch. I feel like there's a lot of storytelling you could do there as well. But although it really depends on who ends up on what show. All of what I'm discussing right now it might be irrelevant if a lot of these people go to smack them. But we, we just won't know until next Friday. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, I, I don't know if like what we're going to get on Monday is like a mix of bag of people just because they already have their plans and who's moving to Raw. So they're like, oh, we might as well just put them in this... This match, and then we'll drop them the Raw or whatever is going on. So, but based on Raw people, like you said, I think it, it would have to be either Liv, Becky, or, or Nia. It's not like it's not like that's a debate. Yeah, no, I think that would just make the most sense. So we'll find out again how the roster shake up next Friday. But we are crowning a new Women's World Champion next Monday. Becky has not been around since Mania. I know she had said somewhere, "Hey, I'm not taking time off." I don't know where people got that from. I think it's smart to keep her off the show for right now to kind of sell the loss and whatnot. I know, um. Rollins will probably be out for a little bit longer, her husband, obviously. Um, not that they have anything to really do with each other as far as their absences go, but I would keep him off the show probably at least until the draft, if not soon after. If he's not going to be a backlash, you could draft him, and he doesn't have to be there. It's not like the days of old where people get drafted to a show randomly and they have to come out and like wave to the crowd. That's not really how it works anymore. So they could draft him, and he doesn't have to be on the show for a while. But with Becky Lynch... Her and Liv Morgan would be an interesting feud to revisit for that championship to kind of hold down that division. In the meantime, until Rhea Ripley comes back, which hopefully is in the not-too-distant future. Now, that opened the show on Monday night. The other big thing on Monday night was what closed the show, the great Intercontinental Championship match between Sami Zayn and Chad Gable. One quick note, though, before we get into the match itself and what happened afterward. We've talked about it before, but it's worth mentioning again. The production level is seriously on another level. I mean, the amount of people that I had heard from over the years saying that we would complain, not me and you, but just like in general, people would complain about like the production levels of WWE not really making a difference and people are complaining about something stupid with the camera shots, get over it, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I don't, I don't know what those people were thinking in the sense that I watch the show now and the production level being on a whole other level really does positively influence the show. And that was the case with Sami Zayn entrance when he made his entrance during that or right before the matchup in his hometown of Montreal, 
Crowd went nuts. It was one long shot from when Jay Uso went to the back, talking with Jay Uso, did Sami Zayn, him walking to the ring through the crowd with the flag as champion. I mean, again, it's it's. I know it's hyperbole to kind of make these claims now, but people are making the case that it's one of the greatest Raw entrances of all time, and I honestly agree with that. It was really, really well done. So, again, I, I, I'm sure you agree with the production levels really uh, being a big beneficiary to WWE's TV right now. Yeah, I think everything they're doing production-wise has enhanced the show. Uh, like you said, specifically this, too. Like, just the, also the linking of him and Jay. Obviously, there's a history there, so that's good. Mm-hmm. Last time they were in the same arena, actually, Jay, I'm pretty sure Jay was was at Elimination Chamber and Jay kicked his head off. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I thought it was good stuff. Like I said, Sammy walking back, saying he's walking in the front door the same way he came in the first time he went to that arena. And it just was very special. I thought it was done very well. And, uh are killing it on the production side. Yeah, no, the entire show you could see it, um, but definitely during that main event, and specifically during Sami's entrance, it was just amazing. So the match itself was great, Sami Zayn beating Chad Gable in a very, very good match. And what's scary, though, is I think they could even do better with more, <clears throat> excuse me, with more time, and I was glad they were given the main event spot. They deserve that. It kind of continues the importance that the Intercontinental Championship has been treated with un- under Gunther for the last two years. It's not like someone won it, and then it went right back to being a prop or a mid-card championship or whatever. No, it still feels like a prestigious prize in this company, which is key to not lose that momentum the championship has had for the last two years. But Sami Zayn wins clean, and it would have been a great moment to close the show with him, you know, standing tall and whatnot, but it would have been a tad underwhelming to not kind of give us an indicator as far as what was next. Now, Chad Gable was confronted by Bronson Reed before the match with Bronson saying, I want next, because Bronson did beat Sammy about a month ago on Raw clean. Um, I think he was off a distraction, but he did beat Sammy Zayn before he won the championship. They had a rematch the following week that ended in a no contest. So they have some unfinished business there. But they did that, and instead of Bronson Reed attacking Sami Zayn, it was indeed Chad Gable going heel, suplexing Sammy literally right out of his wife's arms. I thought that was amazingly well done. The dichotomy there and the attention to detail with Sami Zayn being attacked in front of his family, and that being the reason why Chad Gable snapped after he was attacked in front of his family uh, six months ago, I thought was just perfect. The whole thing was perfectly executed, and now we have a heel Chad Gable on our hands here as he guns for the Intercontinental Championship. I think this is the right route to take. I was very skeptical about Chad going heel. I still am. I still feel like he should have been the one to win the championship in Mania. I'm not... I will die on that hill. But I think the way they've pitted, pivoted has uh, been really well done. I'm really excited to see where they go from here. Yeah, I thought the match itself was really good. Uh, like you said, I like how the Intercontinental Championship is still in the limelight. I mean, honestly, I feel like it's looked upon bigger than the World Heavyweight Championship. But uh, I thought Sammy and Chad had a good match here. The tension to detail, like you said, him suplexing him literally out of his wife's arms. I mean, Jesus, I popped the crowd. Crowd, I thought people were going to hop the rail. Um, <laughs> I thought it was good to see Chad, like I said, have that heel dynamic, tat Sammy in front of his family like he was attached in front of his. I mean, I thought it was good stuff then in the show, honestly. No, it was great stuff. I thought the way they set that up was great. Um, they can stretch this out the entire summer if they wanted to. Again, it's all a matter of what shows they end up on, although I would be very disappointed if they do this feud only through Backlash and have Sami Zayn beat Chad Gable in a rematch of Backlash and then around that same time they draft Gable to SmackDown or Sami to SmackDown and they don't get a chance to finish the feud. Um, I think that'd be really disappointing. I think this should end, honestly, with Chad Gable at least for a little bit, if not for a while, holding and winning that Intercontinental Championship. I think there's a real story there. He's deserved it. Um, Getting him away from Alpha Academy, making him a real Serious heel on this show, I feel like, is the way to go. Um, and also the idea as well, I talked about it on the hashtag yesterday, but people have been pitching since Monday night the idea of Chad Gable turning heel and joining a faction with the Creed Brothers. Now, I know everyone's in a faction. I get it. Um, that's one of my main criticisms of AEW, where it was over the years. But I do think that would be a natural fit. Get him away from Alpha Academy, giving him the Creed Brothers. Yeah, it is very reminiscent of Team Angle, but I feel like it would benefit the Creed who have been treading water for a while now, haven't won a match on TV in many, many months. And it would also give Chad Gable his own little faction to kind of build off of and help him generate more heat and stuff like that. So uh, your thoughts on that idea, or is that something that doesn't really interest you? I like it. I think so. I think it gives like Team Angle vibes, helps the Creed's a lot. I mean, I think they're good, but they just need a little prop up. Um, I think they've been on the show. They said they haven't really won anything lately. They've been on the show. They're just 
I don't know, like they're kind of just treading water at this point. So I think teaming them up with Sam or with uh, Chad would make sense and kind of prop them up a little bit from what they've been doing. But uh, I think it makes sense get away from the goofs in the Alpha Academy and give them some serious guys to be around. It is worth mentioning too. Not only does Chad Gable have a you know gripe now towards the Intercontinental Championship in a rematch and a claim to a rematch with Sami Zayn wanting rematch and or wanting revenge rather <clears throat> that would make a whole lot of sense. Bronson Reed also in the conversation. Another person not to forget about who resurfaced on Raw on Monday night. That being Sheamus, someone who obviously has unfinished business with that Intercontinental Championship. Your thoughts on Sheamus being back on Raw, getting his old music back, which I thought was awesome. Um, but he's another person to keep an eye out for. Maybe that's a long-term story they go with, but we could soon see him and Sammy or him and Gable or all three uh, for the Intercontinental Championship. I think the belt should find its way around his waist at some point as well. It was great to see Sheamus back, like I said, seeing his old music and all a lot of people like that. It wasn't like a huge deal to me, but mm-hmm. uh, definitely a nice touch. thought it was a cool... I don't even honestly remember who he even faced. Oh, Ivar. On Monday, Ivar. Ivar. Yeah. I was going to say, I was going to say Shinsuke. I was like, did he face Shinsuke? No, he faced Ivar. <laughs> no, yeah, Shinsuke, was Shinsuke match lost match the Ilya Dragon up last week. Yeah, yeah. I loved how, uh, like, after the match, he, like, ran over to McAfee and Cole, just kind of, like, showing how happy he is to be back. Yeah. Spilling the, it was good to see that, too. But, uh, like you said, he still has some in, unfinished business. Good to see him back, and uh, I wonder what they're going to do with him next. How bad would it be if he got moved to Raw, coming back from his return, only to get drafted back to SmackDown, and the Intercontinental Championship stays on Raw? How bad would that be? it would be pretty bad. <laughs> He'd be pretty pissed. Um, no, it was great to see him back. Uh, I, I want to see him in the IC title picture at some point. I thought there was a really good chance. I'm glad they, it worked out the way that it did, because I thought there was a very good chance that Sheamus, he was so over-the-top happy when we saw him, and apparently that was just genuine. But I thought he was doing that because he was going to come back out at the end of the show and attack um, either Gable or Sammy or both and end the matchup that way or whatever, and then we would get a triple threat. And The issue with that, though, you would have had to immediately put the championship on Sheamus. And I, I think Sammy, I said before, Sammy doesn't need a long run. He's already been Intercontinental Champion three other times. This is his fourth run. He doesn't need a lengthy run. But that would have undermined Chad Gable, and I don't know how that really would have benefited. I, I think the real story here is with Gable and Sammy, uh, with the whole family thing and, and whatnot. So they can save Sheamus for another time, but happy to see him back, though. And then one quick note here on Raw, one last quick note here on Raw before we get to Dynasty predictions. Uh, we have new World Tag Team Championships. They debuted new belts on Monday Night Awesome Truth getting new belts. Um, the Raw Tag Team titles are no more. This was long overdue, but now that we have separated Tag Team titles... They're finally doing this. I would imagine we get the WWE Tag Team titles on Friday night. As far as the naming goes, listen, I'm in full favor of it. I I fucking love it personally because it brings me back to that 02 early brand split era when we had the World Tag Titles on Raw and the WWE Tag Titles on SmackDown. I think it's cool. So I love the new naming of it. I love the fact that we got new belts. And I think the new belts are an improvement. Are they the sexiest championships in the company that we've ever had? No, but I think they're a definite improvement over the awful nickel and dime titles that we had for such a long time with the ugly red strap. So I'm, I'm very much in favor of what we got on Monday night, but are you, did you like what you saw from the new tag titles on Monday night? I think they're a hundred percent way better okay. than the old ones. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, like I said, I'm not, I don't know if I love how it's like pretty much a carbon copy of the world title. I know the same thing with the women's, but I mean, I guess if you're going that route, it should look somewhat similar. I do like the little red accent in the, in the front. Um, like the name change, like you said as well. Um, those pennies, dimes, silver dollars, whatever the fuck you want to call them, were just not appealing at all to the eye. Um, interested to see what they do with the ones on SmackDown. I someone like leaked one last night. If that's the one, I didn't overly love it, but uh, I think anything's better than the blue and the uh, red belts. Yeah, that's the one criticism, like you said, is that they are all kind of similar. They all blend together. They all match each other, which is nice to a certain extent, but I do miss the days of each championship having its own unique identity. Um, The United States Championship and the Intercontinental Championship still have their own unique identity, which is nice. But the other titles all kind of look the same. All the ones on Raw and all the ones on SmackDown. It's better than it was. I mean, for a long time we had the color-coded bullshit, and they were even more similar then than they are now, so... If they're going to have a sameness to them, I'll take what we have now over what we had two years ago. Because that shit was just... A lot of the belts just look fucking ugly. They don't look amazing now, but they look a lot better than they did. So, I'll take the improvement where we can get it. But, real quickly here, Mr. Marceau, as they let you go, we got Dynasty coming up on Sunday, the AEW pay-per-view. Which I know was kind of lost in the shelf for a lot of people, because everyone was talking about, as we were, the all-in footage last week, and... 
just a lot of some of the dumb things that AEW has done as of late. But I do think looking at this card on paper, it has the potential to be an absolutely strong show. I think, and a lot of their pay per views are quite great. I thought Revolution was really good. Um, I don't want to again make this claim like oh greatest AEW show ever, but it does look like one of their most appealing pay per view cards in quite a while. And they've had some good shows in the last year, but. I mean, there's really not a lot of misses on this card, so to speak. I think the only match... There's, like, two matches I don't really give a shit about, and they just added them, actually, last night on Dynamite. Uh, one of them is, thankfully, on the pre-show. The other one, hopefully, will not last all that long. But uh, we'll get into it here on the pre-show, speaking of which. It's going to be the acclaimed and the Bullet Club Gold factions finally going at it for the AEW World Trios Championship and the Ring of Honor World Six-Man Tag Team titles. Winner take all. Hopefully this does... I mean, I would throw all the belts in the trash. At this point, none of them mean anything. But hopefully this does unify the two sets of championships and Ring of Honor doesn't need its own six-man titles. Those have been pointless for a long time. I mean, you cannot predict this match and say anyone but Bullet Club Gold, right? It cannot be the acclaimed. Yeah, it has to be Bullet Club Gold at this point. I mean, if you put on the acclaimed, Jesus Christ, I hope not. So I'll go with Bullet Club Gold. I don't think there should be any chance that. That they claim get the get the belts back. I mean, Jay White going from main event in full gear to not even being on Revolution to now being on the pre-show for this show. He's slowly working his way back up, but it's not exactly a stellar storyline. But it's better than nothing. It's the very least they could do is have him win. Having him get beat down by Billy Gunn two weeks ago was terrible. Or was it last week? No, it was two weeks ago. Time flies. But yeah, no, they really should win here. Um, we have another six-man tag team match on the show. It's a main card match. It's going to be the TNT champion Adam Copeland, Eddie Kingston, and Mark Briscoe battling the House of Blacks, Malachi Black, Brody King, and Buddy Matthews. Nothing on the line here, but I assume this does lead to a Adam Copeland-Malachi Black match, hopefully for the TNT championship. And if that's the case, House of Black kind of have to win. Eddie Kingston and Mark Briscoe being in here is kind of random. I know Mark Briscoe has had his own issues with House of Black as of late. Eddie Kingston being in there is so fucking random. They just wanted him on the show. Um, but I think House of Black has to win here if they want to maintain any shred of credibility. Would you agree? Uh, I was just say, I think the House of Black have to win here. Um, like I said, hopefully they win here, and then you get uh, Copeland and Malachi Black for the TNT title. But like I said, Kingston and Briscoe being in this match just feels extremely random. Yeah, very random. This feels like a TV match, but it gets them all in the card, so it is what it is. Uh, speaking of House of Black, Julie Hart defending the TBS Championship against Willow Nightingale. Now, it's already been announced for whatever reason. Mercedes Monet's first match, they're waiting until double or nothing, which I don't like because she's already... Not stale, I don't want to complain here, but she's done a lot of the same thing so far on Dynamite. Um, her promos are not lighting the world on fire, so I don't know why they didn't have her wrestle sooner. I heard it might be an injury thing, but that hasn't been confirmed. I'm not exactly sure, but she's already said that she will be gunning for that championship in her first match at Double or Nothing. Now, Julia Hart's been champion for a few months, so that might be the obvious pick. I'm going to go off on a curveball here and say Willow Nightingale wins the championship. She has her own history of Mercedes. I think she's ready for a championship run. It could be Julia Hart, but I think Willow makes more sense, uh, to me anyway. But who would you have go over in this match between Willow Nightingale uh, Willow Nightingale, excuse me, and Julia Hart for the TBS championship? I was going to say, if she's facing Mercedes, I think it would make more sense for Willow to win here. I think you said, I, have, I mean, I have no idea why you'd wait till. To double or nothing to have her debut, I feel like. Like you said, I don't know if stale, but I mean, he brought her in with all this buzz, and she does not feel close to as special as she was when she first came in. She's no. doing weekly promos and moaning on the ground last week. I don't know what that was, but uh, <laughs> that was terrible. We didn't talk about that. So that was bad. really bad. Um, that was but bad. Like I said, I feel like, I mean, I guess she does have, I mean, clearly got tapped by Julia Hart, but like I, said, I think the, the money is in her versus Willow, so I'll go with Willow right here. You know, I don't think it was Julia Hart. I know they, I think they want you to think it was Julia Hart. Having it be Willow and turning her heel would be incredibly fucking stupid when, um, what's his name? Uh, or not what's his name, but what's her name? Mercedes Monet is a natural heel. I think it was Chris Statlander. I think they were kind of subtly teasing something with her. Maybe they want her to think it's Willow and she goes heel and costs Willow the championship, a devil or nothing. I don't know. I just feel like it's time to crown Willow, have her win here. That's what I would do. Um, Hook and Chris Jericho is the other match they added on Wednesday's Dynamite. An FTW rules match for the FTW Championship. Again, how anyone could possibly care, I have no idea. Um, this whole storyline sucks. Doesn't matter who wins. I think Hook should retain. I know he beat Jericho already. I could see Jericho winning. Unfortunately, Jericho is FTW Champion. Again, who gives a fuck? I'll say... Um, I, I don't know. I'll throw it to you first. Who do you think is going to win, Hook or Jericho? I honestly don't care enough to even make a prediction. I don't give a shit, but I'm going to go with Hook. I okay. think Jericho winning, who gives a fuck? I'm going to say Jericho wins. 
I think they want to make this a storyline. I don't think Jer- I think Jericho takes the title and then Hook maybe gets it back from like they did with Jack Perry. Just bouncing the belt back and forth as they've done in the past because they don't know what else to do with Hook. Whatever. Um, Roderick Strong defending the International Championship against Kyle O'Reilly. Roderick Strong just won the championship, so I think Kyle O'Reilly would be the perfect person to take it from him. I just don't know if it happens this soon. So I'm going to go Roderick Strong here, but who do you think goes over? I think you keep it on Roddy a little bit longer. Um, I think, like you said, O'Reilly probably the one to take the belt off him, but I'd keep it on Roddy for a little bit longer. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe double or nothing they could do the title change, but I do think Roderick Strong wins here, though, as well. I agree with that. Um, let's see. Timeless Tony Storm and Thunder Rosa for the AW Women's World Championship. Now they have history. Thunder Rosa was never beaten for the belt. She hasn't been beaten since she returned from injury. She's kind of cold right now. I would love to see Thunder Rosa as champion. I think they should switch it up with the Timeless Tony Storm stuff. That's kind of, I know you've never really been a big fan of it, but at least with me personally, as someone who has enjoyed the gimmick, is kind of wearing thin personally. Uh, but I think Mariah May has ultimately got a factor in her losing the championship. I don't think it happens here, though. I think Tony Storm retains, and she there's more people for her to defend against before she loses it to whoever. I would love it to be Jamie Hayter, but I don't know what her status is. Uh, running that match back a year later, double or nothing. But I'm going to say timeless Tony Storm retains here. But uh, who do you think goes over? Same. I'm, I'm going with Tony Storm. They said I, I mean, never been a big fan of the gimmick. Like I said, especially now, it's definitely wearing thin. Um, Thunder Rose, I like, but like I said, I just I feel like Tony should hold on a longer, maybe lose it to. Hater, I, like I said, I've, I mean, I've just been gone for a while at this point. I don't know exactly when she's coming back, but uh, I think you keep it on Tony a little bit longer. I like Thunder Rosa, but I don't think she's the right person at this point to take it off Tony. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I like Thunder Rosa. I'd be happy if she got the belt back, but I just don't think it happens here. Uh, Pack and Okada for the AW Continental Championship. I feel like this is a uh, slam dunk retention for Okada. Pack doesn't really win whenever it matters most, but it should be a great match. Um, I think Okada retains. Is that safe to say? I mean, Okada should retain. If he loses here, I mean, it would make legit no <laughs> sense. So I have I haven't won here. Like I said, I like Pack, but it's not like he's a big time player right now. So I, I would keep it on. I would keep it on uh, Okada. Yeah, he just won the championship. I would keep it on him for a little bit longer at the very least. Um, tournament final ladder match for the EW World Tag Team Championships with the vacant belt. The Young Bucks and FTR uh, running it back for the fourth time here. I'll throw it to you first, but I feel like this one's pretty obvious as well. Oh, Bucks win it all. I mean, I think this is an easy one. Bucks win here, and then they face off against the Blackpool Combat Club after. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Do you think Jack Perry gets involved and helps them win the championships to only, if only to make that footage bullshit from last week worthwhile? Probably. And then he joins the elite, maybe. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Ideally, I would have FDR win, but I think the Bucks are going to win, and that's just what it is. It, it would be pretty bad if they lost two straight pay-per-views in World Tag Team title matches, so I do think they lose here. Um, Will Ospreay and Brian Danielson, which should be the show-stealing match of the show. I'll throw it to you first. Will Ospreay or Brian Danielson? Ospreay. I mean, I think this one's, I mean, I guess Danielson could win, but I mean, Ospreay's the guy they're pushing at this point, so I think, just like I said, the match stealer here, Ospreay wins and sets himself up for a title shot and title line. No, I agree. I do think it's Will Ospreay, but do you think there's a chance Danielson could win to set up a series of matches between the two, heading a double or nothing, or do you think it's just an Osprey win because he's new and he should probably remain undefeated for a little while? I think Osprey should win. Okay, all right. And it should be an amazing match, though. And then the main event, just like that, Samoa Joe defending the AEW World Championship against Swerve Strickland. Can dude. I mean, this has got to be a slam dunk. It's got to be Swerve. If it's not Swerve, I mean... I guess they could have him hold on to it, Joe, until double or nothing and do it there. I guess, but I wouldn't do that. I feel like it's been long enough. Joe should have won at Revolution. He did. This is where they did the title change. Crown Swerve. We move on with him as champion. It's been long enough. The the chase has been long enough. I don't really want to see him stretch it out any more than they have. It should be a great match. I think we got a new world champion. Would you agree? Yeah, I think, like you said, strike when iron's hot. It's hard now, Swerve. If you wait any longer, I think... You might start getting bad will from the fans, and it just won't mean as much. So I think you had to put on Swerve now. Yeah, you might take the wind out of his sails if they wait any longer beyond uh, double or nothing to crown him as champion. So, I mean, it, it might be still be a great moment at that point, but it would make it even that much more predictable, whereas here there's some uncertainty, so I would do the title change here. But that's Dynasty in a nutshell. We'll talk about that next week and WWE Draft Predictions as it kicks off next Friday. The new episodes available every single week on WrestleRant.com, WrestleRantRadio.com, iTunes, Spotify, 
no longer Google Podcasts. We can find the show on YouTube Music as well, uh, Podbean, all those other sort of platforms. Rate the show, review the show, subscribe to the show. Never miss a new episode every single week. Have an awesome one, Mr. Marceau, and get your notebook ready for the draft next week. I'm going to be quizzing you on who's going where and maybe some NFL draft predictions as well, per usual. Sounds good, pal. I look forward to it, pal. Have a great one. I'll talk to you next week. Later. Join Graham, GSM Matthews, and RJ Marceau every Thursday as they run down their weekly wrestling rants, offer expert analysis, host exclusive interviews, and more. Subscribe today on all your favorite podcast platforms and never miss an episode of Wrestle Rant Radio.